I'm Harriet Lansing. I'm a senior judge on the Minnesota Court of Appeals and the chair of the executive committee of the Uniform Law Commission. And I'm moderator of this excellent panel that's going to explore how federalism can thrive even among the political pressures that affect policy creation in our country. Um, we start from a fundamental sort of basis. For well over a century, the Uniform Law Commission has worked to maintain and to strengthen our federal framework by drafting acts um, aimed at bringing consistency, clarity, and stability to state law in the areas where uniformity can best and most positively be used to affect people's daily lives. And we work across a whole range of front in, fronts in that, the commercial transactions, the financial services, family law, property law, business entities, trusts and estates, consumer law, insurance and licensing, torts and um, contracts and many other areas. Central to this mission, we have what is uh, more relevant to what it is that we're specifically dealing with here today. And that is um, that we recognize and preserve, and at times are called upon to defend, an effective and appropriate balance of federal and state powers and responsibilities. And that's essentially the subject matter that we're going to be dealing with in this panel from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock as we were scheduled and we will try to um, put a little expedition on that. It's sometimes said that the balance of federalism is best maintained through the political process and I think that we heard some of those sentiments expressed by Senator Risch. Um, with the representatives of the people engaged in debate and competition to establish the proper bounds of federal and state authority. If we accept that framework, then we need to challenge ourselves and the other state organizations with which we partner to ask what we can do to keep up our end of this uh, debate and competition. We have four um, panelists here who are uniquely qualified to help us bring a positive focus on that question. David Agnew, to my immediate left, is the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. He oversees the Obama administration's relationship with state, county, local, and tribal officials across the country. He has a distinguished background as a businessman, a scholar, and a community leader. Susan Parnas Frederick is the senior federal affairs counsel for the National Conference of State Legislatures and has a wide range of responsibility for advocating NCSL's policy positions before the US Congress, the administration, and the federal agencies. She has a depth of background in this work and has also served as the senior legislative counsel at the National League of Cities. Michael Skodro is the Solicitor General of Illinois. He brings not only the keen perspective of both the civil and criminal sides of the Attorney General's office, but also some significant years of experience working with the federal judiciary and the Illinois Supreme Court's rules and procedures. During this time, he has also been both an active practitioner and a law school professor, a role in which he continues as a lecturer at, in law at the University of Chicago. And down at the far end on my left is Senator Gary Stevens, who has a blended career of public service and academics and is currently the national chairman of the Council of State Governments. Following his distinguished service in the military, Senator Stevens was a professor of history and humanities at the University of Alaska and has been a legislator in the Alaska House of Representatives and in the Alaska Senate, where he has served for the last four years as president of the Senate. So we turn first to Deputy Assistant Agnew to probe the question of how we can best maintain the vitality of the state's uh, powers and responsibilities in this compound equation of our government. 
Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Judge Lansing. It's great to be here. I want to thank uh, the Uniform Law Commission and uh, John for inviting me to be here. I was actually invited uh, by Governor Dick Riley, who uh, is the uh, first person I ever campaigned for when I was 11 years old. He was a, an unknown state senator running for governor in South Carolina, and a, a friend knew him. We picked him up at the airport, and uh, he has been a mentor and friend of mine uh, since that day many, many years ago. Uh, so it's great to be with you all, great to be with my fellow panelists. Uh, the, the role of intergovernmental affairs is, is one that uh, I enjoy, but most people don't know what it is um, <laughs> outside of Washington, D.C. So whenever anybody asks me that question, I always say it's our job to connect the president to every elected official in the country other than the U.S. Congress, thank God. And uh, we love what we do. We, we try to advance the president's agenda, of course. Uh, we uh, believe in the president we're working for and believe what we're trying to believe in what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, part of that also is just making sure that we try to make government work better. Any chance uh, that we have to do that is part of our job. I, I came to this job uh, with perspective, uh, particularly from local government. I worked for many years. Uh, as the chief of staff for the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Joe Riley, who has only been in office for 37 years now. Uh, he's on the way to completing his 10th four-year term and really uh, used the power of local government to transform a place in, in, in a way that few others have. Um, and in, in my work with Mayor Riley, of course, gained a perspective on how uh, the state government and the federal government deal with local governments across the country. And uh, so I, I bring that to my, to my job. Uh, I know we all have been talking a lot about preemption. When I saw the invitation, I certainly didn't want to come talk about preemption. Um, it reminded me of the, uh, the old story about the guy who survived the flood, the Jonestown flood in, in Pennsylvania. He was the only survivor. So year after year, when he was telling the story about the flood, the water would get a little higher his heroics would get a little more grand, and finally he passed away, went to heaven. Uh, he knocked on the gate, St. Peter came out, and he said, uh, the, the survivor said, St. Peter, I, before I come in, I just want to tell you something. I want to fess up. I want to tell you that all these years I've been exaggerating, and the exaggerations have been getting bigger and bigger. Is it okay if I come in? And uh, St. Peter said, let me check. He came back. He said, yeah, the good news is it's fine for you to come in. The bad news is Noah's going to be in the audience. And so that's how I always feel when I'm speaking to a crowd of experts uh, on preemption. Uh, so I won't be talking about that. What I would like to talk about is just from where I sit, uh, what the intergovernmental system looks like and uh, make a few observation, uh, observations. Uh, the first observation is, is obvious, it will be obvious to all of you, and that is that our entire system is based on intergovernmental cooperation. Nothing works without it. Uh, you can't pick a single type of uh, service that's being delivered at any level that's not dependent on every other level of government. Uh, whether it's education, transportation, health care, immigration, uh, certainly um, emergency response, uh, law enforcement response, as we're learning uh, uh, once again in, in the case of Boston, and certainly our prayers go out to, to the people of Boston at this moment. Uh, the president just spoke at the, at the service up there. Uh, so. For us to have government that works, we have to have intergovernmental cooperation, and we have to have different levels of government, uh, state, local, tribal, uh, federal, that work together. And there are many things that are simple in America. Our intergovernmental system is not one of them. Uh, every state is different. Uh, every uh, type of local government is different. And so it just creates a challenge for all of us who are trying to make government work better, but it's one that uh, we are uh, obviously all uh, compelled to embrace. Uh, the second observation uh, just that, I, that I've seen over the past four years, that there are some great moments of inter intergovernmental cooperation that are worth celebrating. Um, I would highlight, uh, from my perspective, the Recovery Act implementation, uh, certainly not perfect. Uh, I was the uh, recipient of pretty much every type of complaint you could get from a, a governor or a mayor or a county official. Uh, during the first couple of years of the administration. Uh, but overall, that was a big deal, and it was implemented uh, very thoughtfully and, and very well. Uh, my colleagues at OMB did a great job of working with different levels of government to make sure that the law was implemented appropriately. 
Uh, one of my tasks during that time was to put the vice president on the phone every week or so uh, with local officials from around the country. So on a weekly basis, we put the vice president on with four mayors and two county officials so he could hear directly from them about how the Recovery Act was going in their state. And he did the same with governors. Uh, there's also quite a bit of uh, quiet work that goes on uh, at OMB and in the agencies that's uh, worth applauding. Uh, my uh, friend and colleague Cass Sunstein, when, when he was at OIRA, um, did some fantastic work with, with local governments, uh, with us. His door was always open. He met with uh, state and local governments whenever we requested it and really struggled to make, make the system to, to use the presidential memorandum on administrative flexibility and other mechanism, uh, mechanisms to make the system work. Uh, OMB is doing some great work now on, on infrastructure permitting, uh, better coordination and expedited permitting with uh, state and local governments. Uh, the Council of Governors uh, is something we work with the NGA on. It's a new mechanism that was started two years ago, but is already solving some uh, big problems working with state governments. Uh, and certainly, as I said, law enforcement and disaster response. Uh, some very complicated situations are uh, being dealt with and problems being solved by good, solid, intense uh, intergovernmental cooperation. I would also uh, observe that uh, so many of the things that I get complaints about uh, really have to do with how the laws are written. And I think uh, one place where we need to make sure uh, the, the voices of state and local and tribal officials are heard is in the halls of Congress. Uh, I saw uh, recently that there was a, a growing group of U.S. senators who used to be governors and mayors uh, getting, to, getting together to try to talk about our fiscal situation. I think if that uh, chorus, if that group could grow and if that chorus could get louder, we would all uh, be better off. I recall a, a meeting we had once with the president and a group of governors, a uh, bipartisan group of governors, uh, one of the conservative Republicans at the end of the meeting, he said, you know, Mr. President, if we could negotiate directly with you, I think we'd have a deal done in about five minutes. And that that spirit, that spirit of uh, that former governors have and former mayors have of sitting down with people uh, to solve problems, I think is one that, that Washington needs more of. Uh, that it's worth observing that uh, when you work in local government, uh, you feel the same way about your state government usually uh, as state governments do about the federal government. Uh, I remember uh, quite distinctly all the things that uh, the state legislators in Columbia were trying to do to us at any given moment. Uh, same feeling. Uh, fourth observation is, I uh, just want to go back to the question, uh, how federalism can thrive and uh, uh, given the political pressures that affect policy creation, um, you know, I'd say that, that the very factors that make political cooperation uh, more difficult could be turned on their head and used as a reason uh, or, or a justification for making sure that intergo intergovernmental cooperation works even better. You know, we're trying to advance the president's agenda, and uh, we're looking for any way possible to do that. And if they're not happening, uh, if, that, if those paths forward aren't happening legislatively, then um, we're always looking to, to government uh, partners, at creative government partners at the state and local level to help us achieve those objectives. So uh, if Washington is broken, we uh, want to work with uh, governors, Republican and Democrat around the country to uh, implement some of the president's goals and to and to move forward and to make progress. Uh, finally, I'll just uh, conclude by saying that I think the institutions matter. Having the forums for these types of discussions uh, matters a lot. Uh, people highlight for me frequently that there used to be something called the ACIR, which uh, many of you will be familiar with. Um, that I, I don't know if that's the right mechanism for today's uh, uh, marketplace, but certainly the spirit that the ACR are brought to the table is something we should try to figure out how we can uh, recreate and, and make it more likely that the different levels of government get together, uh, not just to implement laws, but to make laws and to make sure that the uh, Congress, when they're passing laws, understands how it might impact state and local governments across the country. Uh, so I'll uh, conclude with that and very much look forward to uh, discussion and some questions and answers. Good afternoon. Hope you guys are 
having a good, enjoyable day at this uh, hot and humid DC. It's a change in the weather from the past few weeks. I'm Susan Frederick. I'm from the National Conference of State Legislatures. And um, I do appreciate your, your remarks, David. I think they're very well, um, well put. And I just want to kind of build off of them, if I may, uh, as someone who comes from one of the organizations that you know we kind of feel we're always biting and scratching at the door. Let us in, let us be a part of the conversation. Um, with respect to intergovernmental relations, we, we at NCSL do work very hard to be both a voice with the administration as well as with the Congress and with the federal agencies. Um, in my years of experience, both there and with the National League of Cities, and in my prior experience as a practicing attorney representing a small municipality in the great Commonwealth of Virginia, you know, one of the things that I have learned is without communication and inclusion, all is lost. If policies are coming out where there's no, no ability to be heard or cons be consulted with, or if the voices of the states and the localities are kind of left hanging to defend against uh, proposals that may not be suitable for them, you've kind of lost the battle before you begin. So one of the things I'll start with is that the most important piece to intergovernmental cooperation and, of course, to the, the life of federalism, as I perceive it, is open communication. Let us know what's going on. We will let you know what we're doing. We want to know what you're doing. We want to be at the table. We want to have a conversation. Sometimes this happens. Sometimes this doesn't. And it really just depends on what the issue is and how politically charged it is. Um, for example, I'll, I'll start with the, the good stuff because that's always nice to hear. Yesterday, a bipartisan immigration bill was dropped in the United States Senate. We played a very important role in particularly the enforcement provisions of that bill, protecting the ability of states to do what they need to do, particularly if they are a southwest border state and also respectful of the role of state and local law enforcement to make sure that the federal government was not um, placing unfunded mandates or unwarranted preemptions on state and local law enforcement. The result in the bipartisan legislation was very favorable to both states and localities and to state and local law enforcement. Um, and, and we have spent the better part of a decade working with members of Congress and also talking to the administration uh, on these types of issues, and we are really happy to see that that sort of culminated in this really um, well-conceived and well-articulated piece of federal legislation. Um, it's, a, it's a welcome relief on an issue that large that impacts so many parts of state government to see that. Um, and I do believe that the reason that it was as good as it is is because the states were heard and the data was put forward, and it was considered, and it was thought through, and the end result turned out to be a good one. So I believe that inclusion is important, communication between levels of government is important, and sometimes, you know, talking to one state isn't quite enough. Sometimes what's needed is a broad perspective nationwide, because what works in California may not work in New York. What works in Maine may not be good for North Dakota. So I do think that there is value to national associations, like the National Conference of State Legislatures, like the Council of State Governments, like the National Governors Association, to kind of provide that broad national perspective um, that represents the majority of the country and can give you a bigger picture. And I think that's important for both Congress and the administration, as well as the, um, the agencies to, to it, you know, be cognizant of, certainly. Another piece of this, which we can't always control, is personalities and relationships. And as much as I like to think I am just about the most likable person on the planet, not everybody likes me that meets me. And that is true of, of folks um, who work in different places. So sometimes you get a personality problem that really has nothing to do with the policy at hand, but it's sort of, you know, if we all just go back to kindergarten for a moment and respect the golden rule, um, maybe we can move forward on an issue. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. And I think there's sort of the variable that hinders both cooperative um, discussions as well as, you know, when they're pertaining to these types of issues, um, sometimes stands in the way of the intergovernmental relationship. So I can't solve that one today. That's just something we all have to learn to deal with. But again, um, I, I want to highlight some of the most successful um, 
relationships that NCSL has had, certainly with intergovernmental at the White House, as well as with the federal Congress. Um, back when the issue of bankruptcy for states and localities was flying around over here during the recession, you know, how many were there going to be states that were going to want to try to declare bankruptcy? Were there localities that wanted to declare bankruptcy? We had a series of meetings that um, were put together by White House Intergovernmental on the issue of pensions and bankruptcy. And what was so great about those meetings was it involved all of our state and local government associations. So what we call the big seven, which is all of the groups that represent, the national groups that represent um, elected state and local government officials, plus all of the relevant personnel from the domestic policy side at the White House to talk through these issues in a series of meetings. And the end result of those meetings, and of course that trickled back over to Congress. We were working both the congressional angle and, and with the White House. And there was a synthesis of ideas that really ended up creating a much better understanding of the pensions issues, the bonds issues, the bankruptcy issues, and we were all feeling like we were operating on pretty much the same page, and, and it worked very, very well kind of moving forward um, in that area. Another area where we have been very active and, and we have found a lot of really great cooperation from both Congress and, and the White House has been in the area of human trafficking. And that has been an emerging issue in almost all of the states at this point. It's really popped out um, just in the last two years as something that impacts not only the criminal justice um, areas, but also the human services areas within the states. What do we do for these victims? How do we provide for them? How do we identify them? What do we do? Um, we had a very successful meeting, again, um, orchestrated by our White House intergovernmental person that brought together all of the relevant personnel from all of the different federal agencies that had a piece of the human trafficking pie. There was, you know, HHS personnel in the room. There were Department of Justice people. There were technology people in the room because a lot of this, the, these types of crimes are solicited over the internet. So there were technology issues that were at play that my members, quite frankly, weren't aware of and were really happy to learn about by virtue of, of having this opportunity to discuss ideas and, and work toward some sort of a, a plan on how we deal with this problem, both at the state level, but also learning how there would be federal support in play if states should ever need it. So those are two examples just from the recent past that um, kind of highlight when intergovernmental is working really well and we are creating these relationships and having these discussions and we are all aware of you know, what the national agenda is and also what the state agenda is. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And I will also tag on to the idea of, of the Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations as an area where I think, you know, something like that needs to exist because it is really the only way to get everybody who needs to be a voice at the table. And I think that it won't prevent every preemption and it won't prevent every intrusion onto state authority, but at least there will be a conversation and an understanding. Um, one of the areas that uh, I'll also mention some of the things that we used to have that are now no longer here that maybe helped um, bridge the gap between the different parts of government, along with the, the ACIR, um, congressional subcommittees. There used to be congressional subcommittees in both the House and the Senate that dealt with intergovernmental relations, and those are gone. Um, that was a place where we could go to talk about these types of issues with congressional staff and members of Congress to kind of raise the things that were on our minds and hopefully have a meaningful conversation about them. Um, the Consolidated Federal Funds Report, another piece of information that states find very useful. Um, the Census uh, Department used to put this out and it would show how much federal money was actually coming into cities and localities within a particular state. And my members always found that report very, very helpful to kind of keep track of where the federal funding was going and who was getting it and what it was, what it was doing. Um, that is now gone. The, the other piece of this that I think would be helpful, OMB used to have a state and local government unit. I don't know if it was a sub-department or uh, you know, a, a 
a group of people tasked with looking at impact on state and local government. And again, that was something we found very valuable that no longer exists. And there's been nothing to kind of fill those gaps to keep the lines of communication open. Um, so I would make those suggestions as ways, you know, that we would need to improve the relationship because otherwise it, it does right now feel like um, many of the things that come before us as a national association are kind of flying at us piecemeal. And I think to build the concept of, of respect for different levels of government, you need to establish the relationship. And it's great to hear that there is, um, you know, a regular convening of, of meetings with governors and a regular convening of meetings with mayors and, and county officials. But the state legislative piece is always the one that is most oftentimes overlooked. So I will say to you, <laughs> when you think about new ways to improve uh, intergovernmental relations, I would urge you to consider the, the role of the state legislator and the state policymaker in some of these instances. Um, but turning away from, from the Office of Intergovernmental for just a moment and, and looking at Congress, there is really the more difficult piece of, of the pie. Um, you know, federalism always sounds good in theory, but when you apply it to a piece of legislation or you try to move a piece of legislation, um, it really seems to lose its luster and get kind of lost in, in the shuffle, being overridden in, in many instances by um, a more popular policy goal. Uh, I don't recall the last time that a bill either passed or failed on the grounds that it was reviving or, or restating the importance of state authority in a particular area. Um, that's usually not, not the reason. The arguments are usually made in committee pro, you know, for states' rights or for the 10th Amendment or for the, the life of federalism. But when the bill comes to a vote, that's usually not an argument that holds a lot of water, even in a big issue like medical malpractice. I can't think of, besides the family law area, you know, medical malpractice and tort reform is a creature of state law, no question about it. But there have been many attempts in recent years by the federal Congress to federalize pieces of the tort reform uh, area on the grounds that it will help states. But in no way has there ever been a discussion with states about whether or not it really would help and whether or not a federal scheme is even necessary. But yet again, you know, those arguments are not what Congress focuses on. What they focus on is doctors need to be able to treat people and there's too many lawsuits. So we're going to go on the too many lawsuits proposition and we're going to pass this bill. Thank you very much, Susan. And thank you particularly for these specific examples, concrete ideas of what can be done. And maybe we'll get a little time to speak um, about that more fully at the end of the comments. Thank you. So my name is Mike Skodra. I'm the Solicitor General in Illinois, which means I report to our elected Attorney General, uh, Lisa Madigan. And I'm basically here to talk about the roles of the attorneys general in this entire process and, and with a, a special eye on preemption. Uh, and I think what I basically want to do is talk a little bit about why the role of the attorney general is really, uh, the state attorney general, can really play a singular role here, one that no other branch of state government can play when it comes to preemption and why it's therefore important that they play that role and have notice uh, of potentially preemptive regulations and statutes. Ultimately, what I'll be saying will, I think, go hopefully a long way to amplify points that Professor Sharkey made, uh, both in her 2010 memo and again today on her panel about the need for notice to state attorneys general. The attorney general in most states is uniquely positioned in that uh, she is the lawyer for uh, all agencies in the state. And that's the unique role played uh, in almost every state by the attorney general. What that means is she alone has an attorney-client relationship with every executive agency in the state. And that, for obvious reasons, gives her insight into uh, sort of the spheres of influence of the various executive agencies and where those spheres may run headlong into uh, proposed federal legislation or rulemaking. And so uh, just from the outset, given her position structurally, there's uh, every reason to think that the attorney general is going to be 
uh, very, very well poised to speak to and defend uh, the interests of the state uh, executive agencies. But on top of that, the attorney general is also in tune with state common law. Uh, she is, uh, and as you'll see, I'll talk in a minute about the effort of representing the states in the U.S. Supreme Court in preemption cases. Oftentimes, the states, when they file those amicus briefs, are defending not state legislation or even state rulemaking, but state common law, which is obviously another critical area of preemption. And it seems to be one that, again, for structural reasons, is often the purview of the attorney general. So you have this person who's uniquely situated to have an eye on all of these things. And she also has a number of methods of conveying um, concerns about uh, potential preemption to the federal government. One is, of course, uh, at the agency level, and I very much like the suggestion made earlier by Professor, Professor Halls about having a, a law firm here, effectively a public law firm that would represent state interests uh, at the administrative level. But what, we're taught, what, what currently goes on is you have individual attorneys general and sometimes collective uh, groups of attorneys general, either under the National Association of Attorneys General letterhead or on their own, submitting comments uh, to federal regulators during the notice and comment period. But it's haphazard and it's ad hoc. Um, it's catch as catch can, as I'll, I'll mention in a moment when I talk a little bit about notice. And certainly, uh, uh, that's an area in which the attorneys general have, you know, found a mechanism to do it, but not in a sort of nationally um, structured way. Although, again, to some extent, they're done, they're run through NAG. Another way is, of course, testimony in Congress. Attorney General Madigan, for whom I work, uh, spoke out and I believe testified during the Dodd-Frank uh, hearings against some of the, the preemptive measures that were being proposed uh, when that bill was first introduced. And so you do have this ability by attorneys general, of course, to speak directly uh, to Congress. But the amicus brief is sort of the other unique way in which attorneys general have found uh, a voice, uh, but it is late in the game. It's in the US Supreme Court to a growing extent. It's in the federal appellate courts. Um, there is a, an organized method by which the states um, work together to produce amicus briefs so the court only gets one on each side of the issue. I will say that preemption is one of those tricky issues. There's always not only the preemption question, but the underlying substantive issue. And at times that means that states are on both sides of a preemption question in the US Supreme Court in, or in a federal appellate court. Um, uh, and that can happen and that's of course okay. Uh, what NAG ensures is that at least as to one side of an issue, uh, there is one, effectively there will be one amicus brief uh, from a collection of states. Anyone who's monitored and reviewed these uh, briefs uh, will know this was not always true. If you look back far enough before NAG began this organizational effort, uh, you would see multiple uh, briefs from state attorneys general on a particular side of a state of a U.S. Supreme Court case. And this, of course, has changed. I think the justices, I'm sure, appreciate the fact that they're not getting multiple briefs on one side of an issue. Uh, but this does allow for, I think, also a more sophisticated um, uh, briefing by uh, state attorneys general in the U.S. Supreme Court. And again, only the attorney general in most states can file an amicus brief in court anywhere, much less the U.S. Supreme Court for any entity within that state government. And so again, the attorney general has this um, sort of unique vehicle for expressing the views uh, of the states. So all of this is to say, because of the singular role the attorney general plays in most state governments because of the avenues open to her to convey thoughts uh, of the state's views on potentially preemptive measures at the federal level, it's all the more important that, that when notice is, when we're talking about notice and communication, that state attorneys general be very much a part of that discussion along with the other groups um, that we're talking about today. Um, and so to that end, I would, I would again amplify the point that Professor Sharkey makes in the 2010 memo, and again uh, today, that a direct notice uh, to attorneys general is a very good idea. I know that, for example, our Consumer Fraud Bureau, uh, which, as you might imagine, is one that uh, necessarily involves potentially uh, potential federally preemptive issues on a regular basis, they have a paralegal uh, who spends much of his time looking at the Federal Register. Um, and looking for potentially preemptive federal regulations. And it is his job to try to pick up on things early in the process uh, when the notice and comment period opens so that our office, hopefully in conjunction with other attorneys general, but perhaps not, 
can file a letter um, uh, in support of or uh, opposed to um, a proposed rule. The other point I would make about notice is there is also a subtle way, of course, and it's not, this is not a point that I've come up with. Uh, several U.S. Supreme Court justices have made the point in separate writings. But there's also a way in which preemption doctrine itself plays a role in how all of us get notice. Uh, as, as some of you who've read uh, the, the series of recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions, Geyer, Wyeth, and so forth, will note, there are a number of separate writings in which justices point out the fact that at a certain level, pure frustration preemption, something that, again, Professor Sharkey touched upon, this idea that there's no express preemption set forth in a regulation or in a law, but nevertheless, it may um, create friction with its, its underlying policy, maybe in friction with um, a policy at the state level, and, is there, and therefore the state law is preempted. That sort of frustration preemption, one of its effects, for better or for worse, uh, is that it does reduce the ability of the states, of course, to recognize that a pending measure, a proposed measure, be it a statute or a regulation, will have preemptive effect on the states. It may go entirely unnoticed. And so, obviously, and, and this is just a sort of a coda on the point about notice, to the extent that um, you have more express preemption or pure impossibility kind, uh, impossibility style conflict preemption, to the extent that's in play, it's obviously much easier for attorneys general, legislatures, and so on to uh, raise their head and, and uh, speak out about a pending measure. So I would just put that as a sort of supplement to the point made earlier about the need for more uh, direct notice to the states generally and, and attorneys general. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a tremendous pleasure to be here, I've got to tell you. Uh, I'm from Alaska, and um, and it's still uh, winter up there, so it's a pleasure to be anywhere uh, other than Alaska right now. So I, I'm enjoying even even the rain. Uh, I'm not a, 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 a legal scholar, an attorney, I'm a historian, and uh, I'll bore you with just a bit of history. Alaska was purchased in 1867 from Russia. Uh, we were at the, Russia had Alaska as a colony. It was purchased for $7.2 million dollars, Interesting to realize that uh, every day some $30 million comes through that Alaska pipeline uh, in oil. So $30 million a day, a day we bought it for 7.2. It was a pretty good deal, you gotta admit. Uh, the, um, we became a territory in, in uh, 1913, and, uh, and uh, the second, then finally a state in 1959. But I wanted to think about uh, that uh, becoming a territory because what happened when we became a territory is we got our first legislature. So we have had 100 years now uh, with both territorial and state legislature. I was um, doing some research on that first uh, state legis or territorial legislature in uh, 1913. The first speech was given by the Speaker of the House, and um, oddly enough, the speech was on uh, federal overreach, if you can imagine such a thing. <laughs> Actually, I'm convinced I could have given that speech on the floor of the Senate, and no one would have noticed. They would have thought, hey, it's just, just right. Uh, same issues we've been dealing with for, for 100 years, federal overreach. Well, I'm here representing the Council of State Governments. It's an organization uh, made up of all of the states, all of the legislators, uh, legislatures, both full-time and part-time, both uh, a citizen and, and, um, and full-time legislatures as well. Uh, it, one of the nice things you get to do as a, as a chairman uh, of the national CSG is to choose what your focus will be uh, in your year as chair. And I chose uh, that it would be uh, uh, federalism as well as preemption and federal overreach. And, my successor has chosen the same thing. So we've agreed for a two-year period. We're going to be concentrating on the issue of federalism. I think it's very important and particularly propitious that you are having this meeting at this time. I really do appreciate it, and I thank the commission for that. So trying to focus on what is the balance between federal and state law, uh, what, is the, uh, what are the boundaries between us, and what, what is that area of overlap where we, we converge? The real trick for state legislatures, I think, is uh, it's so easy to spin our wheels. Um, Supremacy clause uh, can be so annoying. The, uh, the federal primacy is something we have to deal with. And um, the Supreme Court, of course, can invalidate anything we do. Uh, federal law trumps state laws, of course. A states can express our preference. We can disagree with the federal government, both as states and, and, and our citizens individually. We can disagree on many controversial issues and have. Uh, have different value judgments um, than the U.S. Constitution and the Supreme Court have. So this dual sovereignty really is the key, I believe. We, we can't opt out of federal law when we do disagree on moral grounds, 
which we often disagree on, on ethical grounds or on religious grounds. Where the federal and state laws conflict, the federal law prevails. I, I get that, but I do believe that most state legislators are concerned about the rights of their states and believe they have a responsibility to protect those rights and to limit federal government overreach. Since our very founding, we have experienced fluctuations in the sharing of regulations and decision-making powers between the states and the federal government. Over the years, there have been trends in statutory preemption and unfunded mandates that have been handed down from the central government to the states. Before 1900, there were 29 preemption statutes enacted at the federal level, 29. Uh, since 1900, there have been more than 500 federal preemptions in the last six, 25 years, 164. So it becomes clear that federal preemption is steadily increasing in both the number and the scope. Many state legislators believe that the division of powers established by the Constitution should encourage flexibility and innovation in solving problems and should encourage a diversity among the states. The 1995 Unfunded Mandates Reform Act should have eliminated some of the concerns. Unfortunately, it has, that has not been very successful. There is still considerable tension over the matters of preemption, which many believe threaten the autonomy and the authority of our states. The federal government has commandeered state responsibilities, even in what may seem pretty inconsequential matters, such as where to stand on a bus and replacing water coolers in schools. Do these really belong in federal jurisdiction? As insignificant as these examples are, there are several more contentious issues in education and public safety that have received even greater federal attention. States individually and in cooperation with the Council on State Governments and, uh, and NCSL, National Conference of State Legislature, uh, we have challenged the federal preemption trend. Uh, we have opposed federal intervention in widely diverse issues such as stem cell research, Medicaid, gun control, sex offender registration, medical marijuana, abortion, gay marriage, minimum wage, education. This conflict between the federal government and the states regarding who has responsibility for specific governmental functions will continue to ebb and flow, as it always has, right from the very beginning of this nation. Some of these matters are of little consequence, but many are uh, enormously important. Who will take the lead on some of the biggest issues facing us in the future? Recent attempts by the federal government to hand down mandates have met some resistance in the states. Still, still, the states have shown a willingness to collaborate on issues that we believe need attention. Interstate compacts and other less formal agreements have been used which give the states more comfort and assurance on several national and regional issues. This idea of dual federalism is compatible with the Constitution an idea that encourages our federal government and our state governments to work together and cooperatively in solving the problems we face. Still, the states are rightly concerned that over time, the federal government has been encroaching on the governing powers of the various states. It is the hope of many that in the future, states will have the opportunity uh, to retrieve some of their autonomy. In conclusion, I'd like to say I, I'm a little uncomfortable being in a room full of uh, people in the legal profession uh, and talking to him about the law, but that's as bad as it gets. Thank you very much. And I think you've all done an excellent job of speaking about the law and about speaking about this particular issue and is we are trying to give specificity to it. I'm just going to ask one question before I open it up to general questions from the others about um, essentially what many of you have touched on. We had people this morning on this morning's panels who um, emphasized the importance of having a forum to discuss this division of state and federal powers and how to um, eat for each the of units to do um, their role in a maximum way while at the same time being sensitive to the needs and the demands of others. But um, there was also a reciprocal concern about not having a forum, a particular forum in which to discuss this, or a consistent way for states to be able to express their concerns about federalism as they were approaching legislation or regulations 
they did not seem to properly take those considerations into account. If there were just a couple of ways that you could think of that would institutionalize these concerns about the proper balance of federalism as we approach uh, some of these decisions as a country, um, I would be interested in hearing what those ideas might be. Well, I think one of the things we heard earlier was that, uh, you know, if, if the federal government uh, goes through some uh, retrenchment and reduces funding to, uh, uh, to states for various issues, uh, that responsibility needs to be re released as well. I, mean, I just think about the issues that we face uh, in terms of education. Uh, um, and I don't know if you want to go too much detail about this, but, you know, an issue, I, I just met with a, a principal who said, uh, I have one student who has uh, a teacher, uh, two aides and a dedicated classroom, a special ed student, enormously expensive. How do we pay for that? Well, that's paid for by every student in the district. Money goes to the schools based on the, um, the amount uh, about per student head, uh, and, uh, and that money is spent based on the needs of the students. So here we have this enormous responsibility with special education. I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I think it's very important that we, we help our special ed students, but still, an enormous amount of money it will be spent from our local school districts on special education but that is not being funded by the federal government. So the, I think the point that was made earlier is, uh, is if the government retrenches, if it pulls back um, the dollars from the states, it needs to also pull back the, res the, the, the responsibilities that they passed on to us. I would just say, um, having had a little bit of a history with this issue, you know, there is a federalism executive order out there and, and that only pertains to the agencies and it was a really big deal when it was done back in the late 90s. You know, for a little while, it kind of worked fairly well. The agencies got the, got the message loud and clear that we want to be consulted on regulations that have a significant state impact, either through dollars or by virtue of massive preemptions. Um, that, that executive order was reinforced by President Obama with a memorandum that we worked with Cass Sunstein on actually when, when President Obama first took, took office. You know, that was one of the first things we all did was we went in to, to talk to him and, and his staff about the importance of reviving that somehow. And, and there was a memo issued, a presidential memorandum that provided guidance to the agencies, you know, hey, you guys, we need to really consider state impacts and state and local impact. Um, and, and some agencies, do a better job than others on, you know, adhering to those guidelines. Um, the real problem, in my opinion, is with the congressional side. The legislation continues to flow where state impact is not considered. And I, I don't know, you know, there was a, there were, there was a, a time when, when there was a bill pending in Congress to rein, rein in congressional authority a little bit and make them put preemption explanations in committee reports or put it in the record somehow, but Congress didn't want to vote for that. So in my opinion, at least with the congressional side, unless there's a serious turning of a corner and there's a realization on the part of our elected federal delegations that, that state impact matters and it needs to be an important consideration when looking at certain pieces of legislation, they won't legislate it on themselves, and we can't make them do it. So other than, you know, banging our, our fists on the, on the door saying, please don't do this to us again, or, you know, if you're going to take away the money, as, as we heard, take away the mandates and, and let us do our own thing since you're no longer paying for it, um, we really have kind of reached loggerheads on this. And I think the importance of symposiums like this is to try to get the education out there that, you know, this is something that may seem very arcane to you and very, you know, old fashioned, but it really does matter in today's world and it really does matter with legislation going forward. And I think, you know, one of the most important examples I'll cite, whether you're for it or against it, is the Affordable Care Act. I mean, there are significant state impacts with the implementation of that legislation and there are significant dollars, both at the state and federal level that are going to need to be reconciled and, and allocated. And 
I will say that the Department of Health and Human Services is doing a really nice outreach job. You know, they're doing weekly conference calls with our members on how to deal with the Medicaid expansion, how to deal with various pieces of that legislation. Um, but from my members' perspective, whether they're for it or against it, it would have been nice to have that early, much, much earlier on in the process rather than, you know, eight months before the drop dead date of, of implementation. So the ideas are there, and, and I think the, the will is there. With respect to congressional legislation, however, I, I don't know how to bridge that, that morass at this point. I think you know, we have been in a defensive mode for so long, um, it's really hard to, to say how to turn that corner with members of Congress. I get, oh, sorry. Michael, go ahead. I, I was just gonna add very quickly, I think when we think about, I, I agree, Susan's points, and I think to, to build on that, when we think about access, I think we have to remember that it really has, the coin has two sides. I mean, one is um, having a, a vehicle, a method, and, a, and as we've talked about, there are several, and there can certainly be and should be more. Um, but notice is the first side of that coin, too. And so especially, I think it's probably easier on the congressional side to pick up on, on pending bills that are likely to have um, a preemptive impact on state law, whether it be regulatory, statutory, or, or common law. But it can be harder, as I, as I you know, alluded to earlier, when it comes to federal regulation and um, the resources that a state might have to devote simply to keep an eye on what may be pending uh, with regard to federal legislation can, can be substantial. The, the example of the paralegal in our office was really meant sort of to be emblematic of the, of the broader issue that this takes time and money to monitor and to the extent something more centralized could exist simply for notice. Um, you know, that, that, that is the first step or the first side of the coin uh, of, of access. And, and I would uh, agree that I think in terms of the administration, uh, there are institutions that uh, used to be there um, that are no longer there and, and some of those uh, convenings should, should take place more. I think that would be useful. Um, but. I also strongly agree that so much of, of the, uh, uh, so many of the issues that we're talking about, uh, it comes down to how the law was written and what's in that bill that gets passed and signed. And uh, I believe that a, a great deal more focus on, on that uh, would be very useful when it comes to state and local voices. And I think, you know, it's part of a, a, a trend as, as so many entities have, sprung up in D.C. to represent all the different uh, interests that exist around the country. Uh, state and local government uh, entities that are here, uh, we work with them and, and, and think their work is extremely important. They're just uh, voices in a huge chorus uh, on every single issue. There are uh, dozens and dozens of other organizations pushing in both directions. And so state and local government interests are just a little, a little uh, piece of the overall uh, song going on, and uh, again, I think I, I remember very well, even at the state level, uh, when you're representing local government, it's very hard to get your voice heard. Uh, small little state capital of Columbia, South Carolina, we still uh, struggled mightily because there were so many competing interests trying to influence, influence a piece of legislation, and their bottom line ha may or may not have anything to do with how it impacts state and local governments. So uh, making sure that those voices get into the congressional process, I think, is critical. So we have some questions, Mr. Presiding Officer. Can we take a couple of questions? Yes, you may. Paul. <laughs> uh, well, the number of witnesses said, I'm just as curious or interested in, in some of your thoughts about how, what the ultimate group, you know, the big seven and we all say, what some of them should or shouldn't do to help Congress understand that we are not I'll, I'll just say I think that if we could get all those uh, former governors and former mayors who are now U.S. senators and, and members of Congress to remember that, uh, <laughs> that would be a useful first step. And, you know, what state and local officials say all the time to us, it, seem like, it seems like they go up there and forget uh, where they came from. That'd be, be useful. And, and that I, I did uh, see notice that that little 
bit of a nucleus was was getting started on fiscal issues, uh, former governors and mayors in the Senate, and I think that impulse is healthy and anything that uh, we could all do to encourage that would be useful. I, I regret the fact that uh, we, we uh, that our U.S. senators now are are elected directly and not appointed by <laughs> state legislatures because, you know, that, that really was a, a way to make sure that we had some co contact with our congressmen, and now we just don't. I mean, they come back and report to us, give us a speech once a year, but certainly have no direct connection with the state as, as they used to have, and I know that's uh, going back a long ways, but it, it made a lot of sense at the time. <laughs> I think we have the latitude of taking one more question if there's a question out there. There is. Yes, David. I just wonder the observation. Is there in the last uh, 5, 10, 15 years, has there been a greater appreciation or less appreciation for allowing states to experiment, uh, even when the federal government legislates in an area to provide flexibility to the states to allow them to experiment in how they implement programs or the program that they do implement? Has that increased or Um, I would say it's really gone both ways. You know, the two examples that come to my mind just in the last decade, um, one yes and one no. The Help America Vote Act, for example, our big election reform law that passed in 2002, you know, that left a lot of room for state implementation. There were, there were seven federal mandates, but the details were left up to each individual state. So how voter registration was implemented in a particular state, was left up to the, the state and, and the legislators and the governor in that state and the chief election officials. So that was, and we, we worked very um, closely on that bill with the, the sponsoring uh, members of Congress. And we were very pleased with that outcome, obviously. So that was an example of where there was preemption, but it was very, broad and the details were left up to the states. The flexibility and implementation, we got that and we appreciated that. Um, going the other way in the criminal justice area, a bill that, that I worked on, not successfully, <laughs> that's the other, was the um, Adam Walsh Act, which is an act dealing with national registration for sex offenders. And at the time that that act was passed, that was later, that was in 2006, but at the time that that was passed, um, every state already had a sex offender registry on the books and there were already processes in place to deal with sex offenders that were coming through the criminal justice um, system. The law itself was drafted so rigidly, as you've alluded to, you know, there wasn't much anybody could do at the agency or within the administration to make it workable for states because there were pages and pages within the statute that directed states exactly how to deal with a sex offender from the moment that person entered the system until the moment that person, you know, left it or remained in and, and what had to be done down to the very detail of, you know, you have to give this piece of paper to this person on this day. So that's an, an example going the other way that was very restrictive and caused states a lot of heartache um, because there were many states and still we've only got, though this law was done in 2006, to date, only 15 states have been able to comply with it. So that is a testament to how you know rigid those requirements are. That most of the states in the country can't do it, and there you know the penalties have been pushed off, pushed off because there's a recognition, even within the Department of Justice, that the states can't do it. I think education is a, is a really terrible example of of how. Uh, uh, things are, are less free and less experimental in the states than they were because of the uh, No Child Left Behind because of the race at the top. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked when I, when I go to my schools and realize that what we're teaching kids now is to choose the right bubble out of four. We're not teaching our children to think outside the box, to be creative, to be another Stephen Jobs. But I think we're, we're making a terrible mistake in education, and, um, and, and I, th I think the product we're going to see uh, as, as a result of federal intervention is not going to be good, not going to be healthy for America. I, I can't really provide a long-term historical perspective, uh, but I will say that I think there is uh, recognition among uh, my colleagues that a great deal is to be gained by, having, uh, by viewing states as laboratories. Uh, 
And when uh, we work individually with individual governors, Republican and Democrat, and with uh, mayors, uh, that's that's it's, that's is powerful. It's clear uh, that there is so much creative energy and and ability at that level. I always say that uh, Mayor, I'll use it for Mayor Landrew, but I can say it about a lot of people. Mayor Landrew is a one man walking, talking laboratory of democracy. <laughs> He is doing so much good stuff, and there are Republican and Democratic governors around the country I would highlight in the same way. And um, even when there are big, complicated laws that uh, get presented as uh, uh, heavy-handed federal um, uh, uh, heavy-handed federal action, there is still a whole lot of, of creativity and latitude going on sometimes in terms of how states implement them. Uh, the conversations I'm in, engaged uh, in on the Affordable Care Act and that all my colleagues are engaged in, those conversations clearly recognize a wide, wide difference of, of uh, state laws and, and state uh, populations and state instincts. And the trick is to figure out how, with big uh, federal goals, uh, different complicated systems can be implemented in different states. Uh, you know, and, and I think there, that word flexibility quite often uh, means something other than flexibility. Uh, it means uh, we don't want to do it at all. And so figuring out where that line really is is the trick, and, and that's a complicated dance. I think we've just begun to tap the wisdom, ideas, experience, and background of this panel. It's unfortunate that we're somewhat constrained by circumstances not to be able to go beyond this, but I think we can all see the commonality of the issues that we're facing. Susan, as you brought up the human trafficking, that is an act that our conference has been working on. We're bringing it to the Boston annual meeting for finalization this year, and then we begin working with the enactment in the various states. So there's so many fronts that we are all jointly engaged on. So I think as you also said about this panel, the opportunity to come here to talk about these things just points up the importance of trying to continue these conversations. And so I think that this is a, a promise of uh, the continued communication, the continued relation bu relationship building that we can do in terms of our discussions in order to address these really important topics on which we state-based organizations and others are all working cooperatively. So I'd like to ask you to give this wonderful panel another round of applause.